Hey guys, Forrest here with Fofo Astro, and we are doing part two of the observatory build today. So, happy to announce I finished the 3D modeling of the observatory about five hours ago. It's gone through a lot of iterations, a lot of paper sketches and drawings and my brain and all kinds of things. For those of you that don't know, this is going to be my third building that I've built, all small, like shed size buildings. Uh, second observatory and I've learned a lot in that amount of time and the one thing that I learned is model everything in 3d before you start construction because the way that observatories work with moving parts and things like that it's way too easy to uh, get a little too far with your construction realize that you made a mistake and not be able to undo that without a lot of headache so Everything's modeled in three dimensions. I'm gonna share that with you guys in a minute. But before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit about the goals with this building. So last video, we talked about how I figured out where I want it, why I wanna do it, all of that kind of stuff. But one of the most important things you need to consider when you're gonna build an observatory like this is how big it is. And my primary concern was making it as small as possible. The problem is if I go too small and I get my mount in there, and my mount ends up hitting the walls, I kind of screwed myself. So you need to be careful. And the way that I did that was, uh, unfortunately, a lot of mounts don't actually, a lot of mount companies don't actually put the dimensions of their mounts, specifically the counterweight shaft length and things like that. But I was able to find the one that I'm looking for. So I'm planning on eventually putting a Skywatcher EQ5 <clears throat> mount in my little mini observatory. It's gonna be down the road. Until then, I'm just gonna have my Fornax in there but eventually that's gonna be the big mount that I want. And so what I needed to calculate out is what's the furthest point from the center of rotation on that mount, the center rotation axis, meaning basically where the polar scope comes out, to the furthest point out on my scope. And the way you gotta do that is just some simple like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You guys can see that's this what this drawing is here. Uh, basically this is the center of rotation. Over to the left is the counterweight shaft and the counterweight over to the right is the telescope, and then you've got the telescope obviously has length. I've built in enough length and width with the telescope to eventually fit a CCD camera, something like a, a QHY CCD 183 MC, something like that, some sort of a color one-shot uh, cooled astro camera, because that's the eventual dream. So I got the length of the counterweight, uh, shaft, the length of the kind of the stick out part on the other side of that from Skywatcher, was able to put that on there. And then it's just a, a matter of finding the hypotenuse of that triangle, right? If we know the length of the scope when it's balanced, we know the length of the counterweight shaft when it's balanced, we can figure out that hypotenuse, which is from the furthest point on the scope to the center of rotation. And as long as you're sure that that a full circle, just picture basically a sphere of that radius, around that center of rotation point, build the observatory so that it's never within those constraints. For me, that's that, ro that radius was 16 inches. That's what I came up with for the hypotenuse. I know that that's small. That's what it was for me. I bumped that out to 18 just to be sure. So I landed on a 36 inch internal cube dimension for my observatory. That should assume that I have enough room to put everything that I need eventually in this little observatory and I should be good to go with a couple inches to spare. That's super important though. Don't overlook, if you're trying to make your observatory as small as possible, getting this done. The other thing that I'm gonna do in my little observatory is I'm gonna put a little access door. I don't always wanna have to be leaning over the top of it. I didn't build the access door plans into the 3D model because I'm simply not sure how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna kinda fly by the seat of my pants on that one. Uh, and you also don't need an access door, but. That's, that's that, so sizing is super important. The other concern that I needed to think about is how the roof is gonna roll. And I know I mentioned in the last video that I was just planning on lifting the roof off and putting it back on, but at a 36 inch internal cube dimensions, that's like a, you know, uh, what, 36 plus seven plus eight basically. So a 44 inch exterior dimension, that's a little big to like heave that roof off. So what I'm actually planning on using are drawer slides, like the same kind of drawer slides that you use in a cabinet when you open your kitchen cabinets. They make very heavy duty drawer slides that are able to do that. In fact, they make drawer slides that can hold 500 pounds and that are 40 inches of travel, which is what I'm looking at in this instance. Now they're expensive. Those drawer slides cost about 100 to $150 for a set of two, but I built this whole design around using them because if done properly, and I think I've got it worked out, 
uh, the roof will just hover when it's off. There's no support. There's no reason to have like a, a bracket that it rolls down. It's very simple, very clean, weatherproof when it's all closed up. So I think it's gonna work super well. So those are a couple planning things. I think the biggest thing that I can say is model everything in three dimensions. I so wish I had done that with my shop and with my first observatory because I would have learned a lot. And also figure out that hypotenuse of the radius that you need to work with when your mount is going to slew around because you don't wanna make this thing too small that'd be a huge bummer, but I still want it as small as I can get it. So with that said, I wanna hop into the uh, SketchUp program. Those of you who haven't used SketchUp, super awesome. It's free, really cool. Uh, I wanna hop into SketchUp and I wanna look at that. I will say before we do it, I've budgeted this out and I think not counting the drawer slides, we can do this for about $250, which is gonna be super sweet. So with drawer slides, I'm thinking, you know, maybe right around that $400 price point. But again, that's kind of an optional bit. You could just build supports and put some simple caster wheels on it for probably an extra 50 bucks and do it that way. I just want that really nice clean drawer slide. I think it'll look really professional and really nice when it's done. And when people walk by, it's not gonna look like an observatory. It's just gonna look like a garden shed, which I think is a plus. Let's hop into SketchUp, let's look at the 3D model. All right, so to use SketchUp, you need to have a Trimble account, which is super easy and free to set up, which is really awesome. Go ahead and accept cookies here. Um, and what you can do is once you get onto their website, we can go ahead and log in. It's automatically logged me in, which is sweet. If you go to My Apps, you can go to SketchUp for Web, which is super cool. It's got most of the tools. Obviously, there's SketchUp Pro for like pro 3D modelers, um, but that's okay, we just need this one. Now, I have a couple models here. This first one was kind of a, uh, a mistake. It wasn't really what I wanted. So here we are, OBS2 is the one that I want. And I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. So this is the observatory. It's beautiful. You guys can see that in it, all of its glory, it is, uh, this is its closed form, obviously. And now colors can obviously change. You can actually play with that in SketchUp and kind of see how it all goes. Um, also, I should say that there will be, uh, this is not with the roofing on it. So I'm planning on doing a metal roof. Obviously you can plan on doing shingles or metal. Um, I'm also not planning on any of the roofing metal pieces that kind of do a little bit of weather protection. What I mean by that is basically what I have going on right here is just a top piece of plywood. So in reality, uh, let me switch this over um, to a different material. In reality, this is gonna look more like, uh, let me select this guy. This is gonna look more like that uh, with just the plywood there. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover that with roofing and the different uh, pieces of roofing kind of trim that trim it up and make it look nice. That's gonna be steel for me. Um, I just kind of made that silver to make it look good um, in the case of um, just for showing it to you guys. So let me let me turn that back to silver just because I want it to look pretty pretty for the demo. So that looks pretty sweet. Um, obviously you guys can change the color of everything as much as you want. There's no uh, control on that. Um, so let me show you guys the functionality. Basically at the base, we've got a six inch pier coming out of the floor. And that pier is gonna be sunk uh, below the frost line. So you should look up building code in your area. Look at how deep the frost line is in Missoula, it's about three feet. So I'm gonna go three and a half feet down into the ground that pier is going to go. And the reason you want it below the frost line is because when things thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze, frost heaving can actually lift your pier out and change its angle, do all kinds of weird stuff to it. So you wanna, if you live in a in a place that freezes, obviously in your, if you're in like Texas or something, the frost line's gonna be like three inches. So you just go down a couple feet. Um, but you wanna get below the frost line. So that's the pier that's st sticking down there. You guys can see the X, Y, and Z axes all originate at ground level is kind of what I'm thinking. Then we've got some treated two by fours here for the base as well as a piece of base plywood up above with a hole cut in it, super simple. We've got those uh, floor joists, you should say. And also I'm not a builder, so I'm gonna use the wrong terminology. I know that you builders out there are gonna be cringing when I'm talking about like trusses and joists and I'm sorry, I don't know the right terminology. But you can see those floor joists, I think, down there with the plywood on it, pretty cool, pretty easy. This is obviously siding. I'm planning on using T111 siding, just some super cheap stuff that I paint really well, paint the bottom edges, um, and then some white trim pieces just so that it matches my house. But again, you guys can kind of make that look at whatever you want it to. Um, now, one quick thing on the ground, what I'm planning on using are concrete blocks that have cuts in them for uh, corners of buildings to sit in. So I'm gonna level my area, I'm gonna dig down and I'm gonna put a bed of gravel, this whole thing's gonna sit on a gravel bed, 
and then the gravel bed is going to have four blocks on each corner and these corners of the building are going to sit on those concrete blocks. Super simple. So that's that. Now, let's look at the cool part because that's the part that we're all curious about. Um, also, the pitch of my roof is like a 112. It's pretty low pitch and I know that. I'm going to have to brush water off of it when it snows, but I'm not too worried about that. Um, those of you who live in non-snowy climates, you don't have to worry about that at all. So let's roll this roof back. So what I've done is I've actually grouped the roof as a group. So it'll all move as one. And I'm going to grab the move tool. And I'm just going to pick my move thing. And I want to move it on the red axis. And I'm going to move it exactly 40 inches because the drawer slides that I have found are 40 inch drawer slides. So we're going to hit enter here and we're going to slide that roof back. Now, the bright blue, that indicates the drawer slide. I pulled the exact dimensions of the drawer slide from the drawer slide company. I'm planning on just using a standard, almost all 40 inch drawer slides are three quarter inch thick by three inches by 40 inches. So I pulled just kind of your average drawer slide dimension for that, but that's what the blue is. And you can see that when it's off, the roof just hovers. It's pretty sweet, actually. Um, obviously, the drawer slide will be bolted in over here, kind of running down that line so there will be blue there, I didn't do that. But you guys can see there's little trusses under there, which is pretty sweet. Again, don't know the right terminology, apologies builders out there in the world. Um, I've got some really nice two by four structuring. Obviously I wanted to keep this roof as light as possible. The roof was the hardest part. I went through a lot of iterations of roof design. And then we can see inside of it, I don't have any center supports, no like 16 on center studs or anything like that. Because again, this isn't like uh, gonna be that big of a deal. I don't think it really needs or warrants um, the reinforcement of that because there's not really much load on any of these walls. So I'm not too worried about just having a simple, um, you know, four stud construction per wall. Um, you will notice that I've put a stud here um, and then it's the same on the other side. That is to give the drawer slides something to screw into just to make that more secure. Obviously this blue area and what the blue area screws into is taking the entire weight of the roof as a giant lever. So we just want to keep in mind that that needs to be pretty well attached. That's kind of what we're looking for. You can see the pier coming out of the ground. We can see the plywood down there and we can see the very simple truss nature of this. So I'm going to share these plans in the video description as best I can figure out how to share them. It might be screenshots. It might be um, actually sharing this. I don't know what uh, SketchUp's sharing stuff is, but I will share them with you in the description. So you guys can definitely check them out as much as you can there. Uh, but that's kind of the plan. Now again, there's some unfinished bits. You guys will see like this corner here with the siding and things like that. That's because that roof flashing is all going to take care of that and kind of clean that up nicely. Now a couple things I want to mention to think about when you guys are designing your observatory um, if you are going to build one yourself is uh, overhang, right? Here's the deal. This is a view of viewing north. So north is going to be in the red axis in the way that I've designed this. So I needed to keep this roof as low as possible to ensure that I could see over it and that the scope can see over it to see the northern sky because that northern sky is pretty crucial. Um, so I tried to keep the roof as low as possible. And in doing that, we had to minimize the amount of overhang. So let me show you, I'm gonna slide the roof back exactly 40 inches, just like that. Here we are closed. So one thing you wanna think about is the amount of overhang that your roof has over top of your building. And you can see on the two sides, there's plenty of overhang, right? Water's gonna fall there, it's gonna fall off the edge and it won't even hit the trim or the siding, which is awesome. On the back, there's a little bit, right? You guys can see things kind of seal up pretty nicely. Um, there's a little bit there. And then on the, obviously the other side there is. On the front, there's not a lot. Um, it's pretty flush. In fact, that piece of siding on the back or on the very front there, I might paint that white. I don't know yet. Again, the flashing is gonna be over it. Um, but I'm gonna put a little piece of Z flashing on that. And you guys will kind of see as you start building things, if you go to like Home Depot or a store like that, you're gonna see different types of flashing of metal. Basically it's bent sheet metal that directs water in different directions for you. And you're gonna to wanna to think of creative ways to use that. Cause the whole idea is water always tries to move down and you don't want it getting behind things. Like we don't wanna have water behind our trim. We don't wanna have water behind our siding. So as much as we can direct the water that hits the roof out and away from that kind of thing, the better we're gonna be. So it's something to think about. I plan on adding a Z flashing around the entire exterior 
of the building on all of these edges so that any water coming off of that roof is just going to fly off and go down and not hit the trim and start to rot the tops of the trim boards and all those little things like that. So that's my observatory. I hope you guys like it. Um, I think it's gonna be super sweet. I hope you guys check out the plans and like it yourself. Can't stress enough plan how big you need it and how small you can get it. Um, the final exterior dimensions of this thing are what? Let's do a little tape measure tool. Uh, four feet and one half inch at its widest, almost its widest. What is it? Like four feet, four feet, one and a half inches at its widest, which is pretty dang awesome. I was pretty happy about how small I was able to keep this thing uh, by about, let's see, uh, about three and a half feet tall if we count the cinder block it'll probably be about four feet tall. So it's about a four by four by four cube and it'll fit everything perfectly. If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comment section down below. Next video, we're gonna start construction. The first step is to dig the pier hole to kind of empty out the ground, level it out, put gravel down and then start construction of the bed on the floor. And we'll just work our way up from there. Hope you guys like this video. If you did, hit that like button. If you didn't, you know what to do. Question, comment, concern, leave it in the com comments section down below. Hit subscribe up there or down there to stay up to date with future videos. And I will see you guys in the next one. Clear skies.